Hi, welcome to Fright Flicks. This is Nate. And Jamie. And we're bringing you another edition of Till Death Do Us podcast. And that's just sort of a blanket term for any time Jamie and I review stuff. Um, we're husband and wife, been married a couple of years, and fortunately we tend to geek out over the same things sometimes. One of those things that we geek out over is The Walking Dead. So we have been... Uh, bringing you reviews every week of each new episode. We tend to do reaction reviews. We don't watch it, think about it for a couple of days, write something up, and then talk about it. We watch it. We just finished the episode like ten minutes ago. The episode uh, season six, episode four, Here, Here's Not Here. So if you haven't seen the episode... Hit pause, go watch the episode, come back and listen to our review, because this is not a recap, and there will be spoilers. Consider yourselves warned. Right. We won't recap it, but we will go out of our way to spoil anything. Absolutely. No, I mean, you just won't understand the plot points, because we're just running with the assumption that you, the listener, are up to speed. You already have your own opinion, you're just sort of seeing what we had to say about it. And this week, really, there's nothing to spoil... This episode sort of stands alone from what we've seen in this season, really. Oh, definitely. Um, really only two characters. Three if you count Tabitha the Goat, R.I.P. <laughs> R.I.P. everyone that isn't Morgan. Um, when I saw the preview, when I heard that this was going to be a Morgan episode, and it was an extra long episode, just like the season opener, this was a, was an hour and a half long episode, uh, it immediately made me think of the two-parter about the governor, which the entire thing was a standalone story about the governor and what happened to him from when we last saw him until now. And it's one of my favorites because it really does stand alone. It's this great story. And I feel that this was, in the best possible way, exactly that. Um, just like just like with the governor, from the last time we saw Morgan, I you know sometime just after uh, Rick and Michonne left the town, uh, what happened to him up until he showed up? How like, he got so badass with a bow staff how he completely changed his worldview and his philosophy. We really got to see that this episode, and, and the reason that he is the way that he is now is all pretty much thanks to a man named Eastman, who we meet in this episode. Um, the guest star for the episode is a character actor named John Carroll Lynch, who can do comedy. He was in the Drew Carey show. He's really especially good at doing creepy and, uh, he actually got to do a little of both this episode. You got to see his personable side, but uh, you also got to see this dark, creepy side of him. But he knocked it out of the park for me when it comes to empathy and just his his emotive side. That really did it for me. Um, also... She blubbered. She, I did. She blubbered I like did. a baby. So, um, <laughs> and I, I mean... No that, shame. I have no shame in well, that you know whatsoever. What? I don't say that as an attack. I say that as, like, John Carroll Lynch's performance this episode was so affecting that she just burst into tears in the middle of, of <laughs> one of his monologues. I did. So, you I'm know. I'm still uh, recovering, y'all. I'm still recovering. So if I sound a little uh, snuffy, if you if you hear it in my voice, she that's is, why. Like I said, this is a reaction review, so she just finished crying. I just got myself somewhat under control. He was just, he was so good. He just evoked so much emotion and, and empathy, but he wasn't pathetic. He wasn't a weepy sort of like, oh, feel bad for me kind of character. You just felt it come out of him so organically, and I think that that just speaks to this actor's ability to to deliver. Well, and there were basically only two characters in this supersized, extra-long episode. There were really only two people. They were both amazing. They're dynamic. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Lenny James, of course, who plays Morgan. This who I've was, loved since season one. Um, I've loved him since, uh, actually, I saw him in Snatch all those years ago. 
He was in Snatch. Yeah, that he was. Just, I just connected those dots. Sorry, y'all. Y- y'all might be more uh, up on it than I am. You might be quicker to the draw, but... Um, yeah, I was I was reminiscing on Morgan and his son from that was season one, right? That was episode one. Yeah, the from pilot se- from seeing Morgan and his son, and Morgan is just that that guy that keeps coming back and he keeps surprising you. You just can't ever kneel this guy down. And for the record, I, I I've said it before, I'll say it again. I prefer the Walking Dead TV show to the comic book, and this episode sort of personifies why. It has allowed Robert Kirkman to take his own material and do a version 2.0 of it. He can, for lack of a better term, remix something that he did great the first time, and now he can take what works, what doesn't work, and evolve it in a new way, because, uh, uh, just like Daryl Dixon, just like Carol, this Morgan is not the Morgan from the comics. And he couldn't have possibly been because it requires a really empathetic, incredible performance, which is what Lenny James does. Uh, That's another way of saying Morgan doesn't keep coming back because he's essential to the plot. Morgan keeps popping up in the show, he keeps coming back because... He's so goddamn interesting. He really is. He really is. Like I said, every time we see him, it feels like we see a different side of him, a reincarnation of him almost. And to get that from this show, I think, is brilliant. And I think that it just, it carries him so far. Um, Also, something that the show does that the comic didn't do or couldn't do is you get these visual cues and these audio cues, for example, he keeps having this, like, tunnel vision effect. Right, and it affects the audio as well as the video. Yes, exactly. And, I mean, as much as I love graphic novels and I love comics, you just can't get that in a two-dimensional medium. Well, and the big thing for me is I'm, I'm, I'm a character guy in everything. Like, if if you want to be engaging, if you want to tell a great story, you pretty much have to have great characters to do that. And um, it's it's not that the comic doesn't have great characters. It does. But think about it like this. With a comic book, you have a writer and you have an artist. Mm-hmm. So Tyrese, Rick, Michonne, Carl, Carol, not Daryl because he's not in the comics, but everybody they all have the same voice. They have Robert Kirkman's voice. That's how it is. Right. Um, Now, with uh, a movie or a TV show, you have an extra dimension. You don't have a writer and a director slash writer-artist like you do in a comic. You have writer, you have a director, you also have actors, which bring something different to the table. So, in the comic, while everybody was Robert Kirkman... In the show, you've got a lot of great actors. You've got Andrew, you know, Andrew Lincoln, mm-hmm. and in this episode, John Carroll Lynch and and Lenny James, who are able to add their voices and their talent, and it it, it and this is why it makes it better because there are so many more deeper characters than you could ever get in a comic book. I agree. This character also, his name was Eastman, John Carroll Lynch. He said a word that I never even conceivably thought I would hear in this show, which is the word falafel. (laughs) I don't know why. That just tickled me. Hearing the word falafel in The Walking Dead just made me giggle. This man, just from the moment you hear his voice, you hear that he's reasonable and centered and is just he it seems like almost he doesn't know that the world is falling to shit yeah and and, and that isn't the case but uh but no at first it does it does seem like that he's able to function as though the world is not falling apart which i think is such a a tribute to his moral care his moral fiber well and that's part of what makes him so interesting because 
he is actually, now that you say it, this is just occurring to me, he's the dynamic opposite of what the world is. He believes, Eastman believes, that all life is precious. Mm -hmm. So he won't even eat the goat. He eats cheese and milk and, and plants, where the walkers obviously eat anything that's alive, and then anybody that's alive eats anything that they can. Sure. You know, like, we've seen our heroes chow down on, on cans of dog food because whatever they can eat, they'll eat. And then here's a guy that, oh, no, 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 I'm only going to eat certain things. He's in his cabin, he's centered, it feels, again, like, he's behaving as though the world isn't falling apart, I can make this work, and I just, I have such admiration and respect for that, he's such a compelling character for that reason. I mean, and just even when when he captures Morgan, he gives him ample opportunity to come at him like a human. He says, put down your gun, come talk to me, you know, this is my cabin, that's my goat Tabitha, um, just come talk to me, and he doesn't. And so he finally captures Morgan, and he says, you know, what's your name? And Morgan says, you know, just kill me, just kill me. And he says, well, you know, that name's, he says something to the effect of like, oh, you know, that name's pretty inconvenient. It's like, again, he's humoring him. It's like he doesn't, he, it doesn't affect him. It doesn't get to him. The state of the world. And I just love that. Well, that actually makes sense, considering by the end of the episode what we know about Eastman. So, Eastman has... He's not going to be back. He's This is a one-episode character. He's a single-serving character, to, to, to quote Tyler Durden. Fight Club! But... Why he's, um, I think, made an indelible mark on this show is, as, as you were saying, he uh, he's sort of an island unto himself in this world of bleakness. He's retained his humanity. Um, he has his own unique, and remind me to get into this, in, one might say insane worldview, but... Um, he's held it together so well, I think because of what we find out near the end, he did something inhumanly barbaric during the transition. So uh, uh, imagine this, uh, uh, you're a law-abiding like citizen, you're a good human being, you're a family man, something so unbearably horrible happens to you that it it turns you into something else. So... He, he kidnaps somebody evil, and he watches him starve to death for 47 days. So, he was out in the middle of nowhere when the zombie apocalypse happened. Um, which is, I think, essential to who he is and his story. So, imagine what it would take to sit for 47 days and watch somebody slowly die. Now, as a father, somebody killed my family... 47 days watching him die slowly, that sounds about right, <laughs> but it also would, would, would crush your soul, Absolutely. no doubt. It's, no. Uh, um, and, and so after, after doing something so horrible, he, was, he went back to civilization with the intent of turning himself in to mm -hmm. go to jail to atone for it, and he can't because he went back and, and civilization is gone. Well, as he said, there's no one to turn myself into, and I think that it's almost like he's ahead of the curve. It's almost like he's more evolved than everyone else in this situation. He'd already turned. He'd already given himself over, you know, like you said, he already did this barbaric, horrific thing. So doing more barbaric, horrific things is just not... In, in his agenda. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So... Um, um, from a different perspective, though, it also made me like Eastman in a different way because in our world, in which, in which real people live now, uh, you doing something like that, you you kidnap somebody and you starve them to death for forty seven days. 
that makes you evil and insane. So he kind of, Eastman kind of went evil and insane. And then now he lives in the zombie apocalypse world in which uh, killing to survive is sort of an absolute. You kind of have to do it. Mm -hmm. And so now that he has evolved and he's preaching peace and tolerance and respect for life, now he's still insane. <laughs> the, the entire world flipped and he flipped and he's still, like, for all intents and purposes, like, in this world, he's crazy. He's the crazy one. Oh, you've you've come at at me. You've come to my home to kill my goat and kill me, and I give you I give you an out, and you still try to kill me. So I won't kill you though. I'm gonna try and redeem you. That's nuts. You're right. You know he's always on the wrong side <laughs> of crazy, but you like him for it because again, it's like to be sane in this world, you have to be crazy by our standards. Well, it all came down to the strength of his story, and his story was strong. He came by it honestly. He went crazy in our world in a way that you can totally understand. And then with his experiences in the zombie apocalypse world, he's equally crazy, but you can still understand it. it it makes sense. The character makes sense. He resonated. Which is probably why I was blubbering like a baby by the end of the episode. Also because I'm a little drunk, full disclosure. I had a couple of drinks. Just, so. just a couple, though. Um, this episode, uh, this episode um, stands out from the season because the season has been... From the very outset, it's been balls to the wall intense. Something is always happening. This, they stepped away from it. Um, the, the framing device with Morgan talking to the captured wolf, that kept it enough in the here and now um, to, like, anchor it. But it was a, a, a standalone, dramatic episode. And I really feel the season needed this. I agree. It was like a nice little breather, but it wasn't a, a waste in any way. You got a nice view of Morgan. You got a really great background as to why he's so different as to the last time we saw him prior to Alexandria, when we saw him with Rick and Michonne, and when he had just lost his ever-loving mind. It bridges the gap. It exactly. Exp it explains who he is now. Yes. Um... But the big thing for me, the, the the big win for this episode was that it was an hour and a half long. And if we were to recap the episode, it would it wouldn't sound like a super long episode. Now, um, the season opener. That sounds like a really long episode because it's so much so happens. So much happens. This was very self contained. It reminded me in some ways of the Grove, you know, or the Governor episodes. Um, it it didn't feel like an hour and a half. It felt like a single episode, which it means I guess they needed every extra minute they had because it didn't feel long. It didn't feel bloated. No, not al at all. Although it was a very slow episode in terms of af action, it never felt slow. It was completely engrossing. It was... It was amazing character work, and once again, like, another facet of why Walking Dead is one of the best shows on TV. They give you action and gore and craziness and intensity, and then they can turn around and give you a character study. Nate, was it a little convenient that the person that Morgan met when he was just falling apart was a psychiatrist? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and there were uh, there were a lot of convenient things in it. I mean, the first few minutes of the episode, when uh, you know he he first got thrown in the cell, we were like, "Why does this guy have like a fully operational prison cell?" And you know that ended up making sense. But then again, yeah. isn't it convenient? What yeah. are the odds? No, they explain it later. But my thought was. You don't get a contractor after the zombie apocalypse. This guy had to have already had a full-on prison cell built in his little remote-ass cabin in the woods. 
who even has that? Who has that? Oh, this guy has that. That seemed a little weird. Again, as Nate said, they explain it. It ends up making sense. But at first, it's just preposterous. They they explain it enough. But, I mean, if, if we want to look at things of convenience, yeah, there, there's a lot of it there. As, as I sort of mentioned, I mean, you want to you wanna talk about something that feels written. And this isn't even a diss. This is just being honest. Something that feels written. Morgan wouldn't shoot his dead wife who was a walker the wife ended up biting his son and killing his son so he has to live with that and then he kills somebody and he gets redeemed and the person he killed ends up coming back as a walker and killing his redeemer all of that yeah. feels super convenient but it, it only like I'm, I'm saying it kind of glibly when it when it plays out in the show it isn't that bad. No, you're swept up in it, and it makes sense. But now that I've had an hour or so away from it, sure, it feels kind of convenient and, and almost too easy, I guess. And the other thing was, throughout this entire episode, Morgan keeps saying, just kill me, just kill me, just kill me, just kill me. Um, I'm sorry, but in this world, there are so many ways to die. Yeah. He could have died at any moment, but he doesn't. So, does he really want to die? Probably not. Maybe he's Catholic, you know? I mean, you want to die, but you can't slit your wrists, because... Sure. You so, can't slit your wrists, but you know what? You don't have to fight a zombie. Do you know what I mean? No. You can passively die. And I am Catholic. I know that. Yeah, no, no, no. It, it, it's true, and honestly, I think they went back to the "just kill me well" one too many times. Yeah, you know, it, it worked once or twice. Um, okay, I get saying "just kill me" when someone that you don't know, who could very well be a psychopath, has you locked up in their friggin' living room jail cell. I get that. Kill me instead of torturing me. Kill me instead of letting me starve to death. Kill me instead of letting me turn into a walker. I get that. But if you legit just want to die, friggin' just go outside and walk in the woods and you'll die eventually. You'll die really, really soon. We've uh, sort of been making jokes over the course of the season. I've been calling him Kung Fu Morgan. <laughs> uh, because, I mean, for the obvious reason. Because, you know, he's, he's Kung Fu Morgan. Um... And a lot of these things that we're saying are are convenient or feel written. I almost want to give the show a pass because this episode in particular felt to me kind of like a kung fu movie. It did. You know, you, you've 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 got a warrior who's lost and he's deadly, but he's got no reason to live. And then he finds a sensei. Yes. Who takes him in? He teaches him not only how to fight better, but he teaches him a worldview. A, a he, philosophy. He makes him a better person. I mean, they did the... It's in, like, it's basically nine out of every ten kung fu movies, and it's Kill Bill Volume 2 as well. I was just well. going to say that! Well, I was just thinking of Kill Bill. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because that's... It's like the kung fu trope. And that's what they do. So it just... I liked it. It fit, but it also justified my running joke for the whole season of calling him Kung Fu Morgan. Because now we see his backstory, and it's totally Kung Fu. And while it reminded you of Kung Fu, I mean, I am i was not someone who was brought up on Kung Fu movies. I mean, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with it as an, as an overarching storyline. But the thing that it reminded me of was Napoleon Dynamite. That quote where he says, oh, there's a buttload of gangs at the school and they keep trying to recruit me because I'm good with a bow staff. That's what it reminded me of and my husband made me a meme and sent it to me because this is how we flirt. Um, but that's that's what I thought of is, is, you know, just Napoleon with the bow staff. But <laughs> in any event, you know, it's not really that important. But it is funny. Yes. Um, okay, so season six, episode four. This has been... A stellar season so far. We haven't had a misstep. Uh, we rate every episode on a scale of 1 to 10. What rating would you give Here's Not Here? 
Oh my gosh, I would give it a nine. Yeah, I'm going to give it a nine I out of ten. It. Yeah, a, a nine out of ten as well. And um, it didn't further the storyline of, <sighs> of Alexandria and the road and trying to divert this whole horde of zombies. It didn't, but I didn't care. No, no. I didn't care. It was such a good self-contained episode. I loved it. I'm going with nine for production value, for acting, for storyline. I loved it. It was it was wonderful. It, it was a nine out of ten, definitely. And I could actually, <clears throat> I could see myself in five years. The show is over. I'm rewatching it, and I watch this episode, and I'm like, ah, no, 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 I was wrong. That, that's a ten out of ten because. Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard to... I, I won't do that. It's a 9 out of 10. I can't go higher than that because it's so out of step with the rest of the series. But yes. but this is actually one of the things that I love the most about Walking Dead is this is the sort of confidence that, that you can only get by being the number one show on television. When you have the confidence that's given to you by millions of people that tune in, then you can say, oh, you know what? We've got this super intense, compelling storyline going on, and we're going to ignore that (laughs) this week. We're going to go someplace else. We're going to go someplace quiet. They did it last season where they spent an entire episode um, in that hospital. That's right. Um, And they introduced a whole new batch of characters. Like, none of the regulars were on it except for Except for the one girl. What's Beth. her name? Beth. That's R. right. R.I.P. Beth. I yeah. still miss you. I'm Okay, also, side note, I'm a hardcore Bethel shipper still to this day. So if anybody out there still really loves Beth and Daryl together, feel free to get at us. Make a comment. Or if you're <laughs> against that completely, let me know. Oy vey. I, I'm never giving this up. No. I know. We've talked about it a hundred times. I'm never giving it up. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. Well... That's why I liked this episode. That's why I liked that episode, which people roundly hated because it stepped completely away from the narrative to do something different. I love that you've got the nuts to step away from such an intense, arresting narrative to do something quiet character building. That's awesome. That's why I love this show. And not only to do it, but to do it well. You know, it's one thing to do it because you can it's another to do it because you've got something to say and you've got something to deliver and this episode completely delivered loved it yeah i mean this episode uh delivered so well that i'm gonna i'm gonna put morgan on the safe list for like the rest of the season oh Uh, i'd give him like maybe three episodes I don't know. I can't. I'm not confident enough to say rest of the season, babe. Rest of the season, we've got. This was episode four, so we have four episodes left. Then we go to the break and we come back for eight more. I'm gonna. I'm gonna say he's gonna live for the rest of the next four episodes, and maybe, maybe, maybe by the near the end of season six, ten or twelve episodes from now, maybe he could die. But. uh, after this, after all the all the damn buildup he's had, he's had this episode. He feels so real. He's such a real character he's now. He's very much flushed out. Yes, he is. I mean, and um, to get back to last week with Glenn, which Glenn's not dead. Yeah, and particularly after this week, when you Glenn's skip not a dead. week. Um, but with that, they hadn't really done anything major with Glenn in a while. So, this this was major. This was deep. This was character building. I see I see Morgan sticking around for a while now. That's just my prediction. But all right, that wraps up this week's episode of the Walking Dead review on from Death uh, till Death Do Us podcast. Till Death Do Us podcast. Thank you so much for listening. We both give it a nine out of ten. Continuing this amazing run so far this season. We will be back next week with a review of the new episode. I'm also trying to convince Jamie to watch the premiere episode of Ash vs. Evil Dead and review that with me because she doesn't know anything about Evil Dead. So I think it would be really fun 
If you're listening to this all the way to the very end, leave a comment and encourage her to do so because she'll listen to you more than she'll listen to me. You're damn right. (laughs) All right, until next week. Good night.